I'm Father Mitch Paquin, and welcome to EWTN Live, where we bring you guests from around the world. And tonight, we will talk about how we can find and hold on to the absolute truths of morality in the world that's being very dominated by relativism and pseudo-moralists, just like we have talked about over the last few weeks. But before we get to that, we want to speak briefly with EWTN's John Elson about a new film that is premiering on EWTN next week. John, what do you have for us this time? Well, Father, it's good to be with you. I want Thank to let you. you and our audience know that next Wednesday, June 28th at 10 p.m. Eastern, we'll be premiering a new film entitled To the Top, Pier Giorgio Frassati. Mm -hmm. Now, Pier Giorgio Frassati was kind of a, a living icon, if you will, of our Lord's words in the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 10. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Mm -hmm. Now, though he only lived for 24 years, he had an incredibly full life. His, he was born into a noble family in northwestern Italy in a town, a city called Turin. His mother was a painter. His father was an, a senator, founder of a national newspaper entitled La Stampa, and also served as ambassador to Germany uh, following the First World War. Now, despite all those uh, that, that wealthy upbringing, he was amazingly detached from material things. He would literally give the shirt off his back and the shoes off his feet to those in need. He'd give his, his bus fare. He'd find other ways to get people uh, medicines and school fees. He had this amazing love of, of the poor and the suffering. He called the poor and the suffering my masters, and I am their servant. He also said that it would be an injustice to have enjoy good physical health and not use it in service to the poor. As he moved into his university years, he was equally spiritually generous. Uh, he would be constantly inviting his classmates to conversion to rediscover the sacraments. He founded a group with a tongue-in-cheek name called the Society of Shady Characters, whose role was to have the, uh, the, the faith and, and, the, and the church have a presence, not only in university life, but also in the public square. And one of the sayings that I think I found to be most, um, most powerful was this idea that we were called not only to exist, but to live. Mm -hmm. Many live their lives with their to-do lists, with just simply checking off the boxes. And he said, no, we, we have the faith. We're called to live with abundance. But that abundance comes from a, a life of, of, of devout uh, spirituality. So he had a great love of our Lord and the Holy Eucharist. He practiced overnight uh, nocturnal uh, Eucharistic adoration, had an incredible love of Our Lady, which gave him that power, that, that, that grace to, to evangelize others. So we have a brief clip that we'd like yeah, to show. Let's take a look at it. I'm deeply ashamed of this, especially when I see so many youth falling for fascism or communism like flies to shagged water, simply because no one is proclaiming to them the truth and the life of the gospel. But before any action, I exhort all of you with the utmost strength of spirit to stay as close as possible to the Eucharistic table. There, you will draw the strength to fight against all adversities and all temptation. This is the right preparation before we throw ourselves into the apostolate. And now, lazy people, let's get moving. Let's go. And climb to the top. The way we use the precious time of our lives should be like climbing in the mountain. Make us robust, build our character, and most of all, lift our hearts to the Most High. Sounds like it'll be an exciting movie. You know, it looks, looks very good, very energetic, but, which was Pier Giorgio Frassati's life. Now, blessed right. Pier Giorgio right. Frassati. So it'll be Wednesday, June 28th at 10 p.m. Eastern Time on EWTN. Thank you, John. And we'll be back in just a couple minutes with tonight's guest, so please stay with us. Welcome back. 
Our guest has been a good friend of this network for many years. He started making programs back in 1989. He's been on many of the live programs and has done quite a number of important series. And he's here tonight to share with us how human beings can find true freedom, which is not the truth that we develop on our own minds to suit our own tastes and desires, but it is freedom that comes from the truth handed down from Jesus Christ to his disciples and from the disciples to the church to, and to us. Also the teaching magisterium of the church that reflects on that truth. One of his newest books is called A Primer, on fundamental moral theology. So please welcome Father Brian Milady of the Order of Preachers. Good to have you. Nice to be here with you. Again. <laughs> it's again. good to have you again. Yes. Uh, so, you know, the last couple of months, I've spoken about a number of topics, I have guests on dealing with a number of topics that relate to morality and the breakdown of morality that has gone with the breakdown of the commitment to truth. You know, we talked about relativism and a variety of other issues that are to the foreground and have a lot of political power and media power. You know, people are still getting kicked out of the media if they disagree with some of these very popular issues, especially on human sexuality. Um, today, we want to talk about your book, A Primer on Fundamental Moral Theology, because it's not enough to criticize the foolishness. What you do in this book is present the antidote by giving a way to think about the truth in moral theology. So I want to thank you for doing that. You did a great, great job in mm -hmm. this book again, you know, like your other books. So this is important. One, you talk about, first of all, even within the church, there is a, a, a crisis about what is morality. What's the basis of morality? Can morality change? Talk a little bit about that. Those some of those problems that we've seen in the church, and how Saint Thomas is the antidote. Well, I became very much aware of this. Of course, I knew about it in the seminary because, as you know, I went to Berserkly in the late sixties. <laughs> That's Berkeley. Yeah. But I taught Which Catholic. is a consortium of a number of Catholic and Protestant seminaries. Yes, which now is almost dead because, especially the Protestants, because they don't have any seminarians. No. But um, I taught Catholic high school in Los Angeles in the 70s, and I was given this piece of trash book to teach ethics, mm -hmm. and I had to develop my own class, basically. And it was around this time I became aware that my problem was small compared to the problem in the church in general. You know, these are the days of values clarification yes. and Lawrence Kohlberg and the six stages of human development. And there was a book that was also written and recommended by the Catholic Theological Society of America called Guidelines to Human Sexuality by Priests and Moralists mm -hmm. that even now we find this odd, but this was in 1979 justified bestiality, provided people thought it was loving. <laughs> and so I thought, I'm going to write a doctorate. I'm going to write about this. Because even though I'm more interested in dogma, they're trying to change dogma to justify their moral practices. Yeah, Archbishop Sheen wrote and said that if you don't believe the, uh, what we have, you will act in accordance with what you what don't you believe. believe. Right, yeah, sure. 
So anyway, uh, the school of thought that was most prevalent at the time was called consequentialism. Mm -hmm. And the consequentialism was basically the idea that there were two systems of ethics, one of which were the laws, the universals, mm -hmm. but they weren't, even, though, even if they were true, they couldn't be applied in every specific example. So I told you this last time, I always love quoting you when we talk about this, this idea, that so they said, well, every single moral choice demands that you do the rules of discernment like St. Ignatius taught, and it may lead you to discern something which is contrary, like for example, contraception, to what the magisterium teaches in your particular given instance. And I remember your reaction was, Father Brian, you, you can't discern against the Holy Spirit yeah. in the, uh, the, the church in the Ignatian exercises. And I thought, well, I'm glad to know that because as a Dominican, I didn't know much Rose, about the, this. The rules of, uh, of discernment that St. Ignatius wrote said that you must think with the, the church. church. Those Centuri, are his phrases. Centurica Ecclesia, yeah. Exactly. So anyway, uh, that uh, I've been appalled because I thought this problem was finally going to be resolved by Veritatis Splendor. And it, the, that's an excellent encyclical, probably the, I think the best one that John Paul II wrote. And then he also had those wonderful teachings of theology of the body. Mm -hmm. But I've noticed in the last 10 years, the people have started to repudiate those documents and those John Paul II's teaching. And they've gone back to uh, what would we would call a, 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 the consequentialist approach, which leads to relativism. There's nothing that's always true. When you say consequentialist, what does that mean exactly? Well, that's a good question, because yeah. when I researched it, they call it by different names. Mm -hmm. They had at least five names for the same idea. And uh, proportionalism, moderate teleology, all these academic smokescreen names, but it basically boiled down to the fact that even if you should think, because they didn't want to give in the situation ethics totally, but they wanted to allow for contraception. Even if you should think that the church's teaching is generally true on something, you could still act against it in good conscience and everything would be fine. Mm -hmm. And you basically discern this, well, with your confessor, supposedly, who supposedly allowed you to say, well, you have good reasons for practicing contraception, mm -hmm. so therefore I'll go right ahead. There's nothing wrong with it. So uh, the relativism of truth, of course, is something that comes down to us. Its primary representative, oddly enough today to say, was Immanuel Kant, who, had, who taught that he agreed with uh, the Scottish philosopher David Hume. This is in like 1789 or 90 that um, you couldn't discover absolute truths through reason looking at the world like Aristotle did or Thomas Aquinas. But he was a pious Lutheran and believed they had to be there. So he said, well, you can't discover these things by pure reason, by thinking uh, and examining things, the world, objective world outside of you. So he had practical reason. It's that you need something is what makes it true for you. So there is no truth in a thing but what you put in it. So today, of course, well, the truth of my sexuality is what I perceive it to be. Mm -hmm. And there's no absolute rules outside of it. So if I perceive today I'm a man, tomorrow I'm a woman, the next time I'm a man, the next time I'm a woman, all those things are true. It, it and applies, it's, it's not, it, it totally undercuts all traditional thinking about objectivity when it comes to our conduct. Now, and, and that's why I want to get, you know, these are the problems. Right. And these problems, you know, a lot of folks don't know who Immanuel Kant is. Of course is, not, yes. But the philosophers who came after him used his oh, ideas yes. all over. Right. The philosophy, it's dominated. And one of the things that I really liked is that you're saying, wait a second, we can point to something called human nature. Right. 
and that God has created human nature in his image and likeness. And on that basis, we can say that there is absolute right and wrong. Right. And in fact, uh, you know, that's what the whole purpose of the discovery of morals is, for one thing. However, and this is where Thomas Aquinas comes in, there are many otherwise very well educated and even very devout Catholics who never heard of the basic cornerstones of our moral teaching. Yeah. In the parish <clears throat> where I live, I, offered a, I offer a class once a month. So I, one of them I entitled The Moral Determinants, which remember are object, intention, and circumstances. Well, our doctor, who's a very brilliant uh, doctor, who's also very pro-life and everything, comes and says, what, do you, what, what is this class about? I said, well, you, you've never heard of the moral determinants? No. I said, well, they're in the catechism, <laughs> object of attention, and they're the way you judge something to be good or evil. Mm -hmm. And all three of those things have to be judged accordingly. Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> How are you going to know what our traditional teaching is if you don't understand our basic, you know, there's no arrows in your quiver or nothing in your arsenal from the traditional ideas of the church to figure it out. Questions like capital punishment, um, questions like, for example, the difference between theft and borrowing. Well, they're determined by object, intention, and circumstances. And then, of course, the big bugaboo is conscience. What is conscience? Everybody uses conscience today to justify just about everything. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, most people, when they think of conscience, they think of my feelings. Exactly. My feelings subjectively exactly. tell me this is right for me. Mm -hmm. But conscience in St. Thomas and in the general Catholic tradition is a syllogism. It's a logical syllogism in your intellect. And you begin with, I must do good and avoid evil. That's the major. Then the minor would be, uh, killing this man is evil. And then the conclusion would be, therefore, I must not kill this man. But if you think it's just according to what your feelings are at the moment, well, I don't really feel I can have a child right now, so I'll have an abortion. Or I remember one uh, woman told me that... Uh, she had artificial insemination because she really wanted a child. And I said, but you know, that's a sin. She says, but doesn't the church want us to have children? I said, yes, but by illicit means. Yes. <laughs> you know? See, well, that's another element that if you don't know what your purpose is or what the purpose of the things around you are, then you don't know how to choose good means to a good goal. Exactly. You, know, you, you can have a good goal, but the way you get to a good goal has to be a good way. You can't say, well, I want my family to eat, so I'm going to kill this guy and take all his food. Right. That's not a good way to have your family eat. As good as it is, you cannot destroy somebody else's life or property. But you know, the 20th century is replete with uh, objective goodness being basically given up. And probably the, the place where it really began was in World War I. Mm -hmm. I also quote Einstein um, because he developed that equation of relativity about 1920. But then to his horror, it became not just applied in physics, it became applied in ethics too. Mm -hmm. And when he saw the fruit of his little equation in the atomic bomb, he supposedly said at the end of his life, I wish I just remained a simple watchmaker. <laughs> yeah. 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 But, but he himself couldn't understand why people had switched from nature in the, in the, non, in the inanimate sense to uh, freedom to, to justify what they're doing. Now, Kant thought freedom was not being interfered with to make these choices. See, th that's, that's a key point uh, mm -hmm. that is so common. 
today that for Immanuel Kant, freedom is not having your choices impeded by anybody else. That is what most people mean by freedom today. And, and there's no higher law. You're a law unto yourself. Mm -hmm. And uh, supposedly the law is, as you know, the greatest good for the greatest number. What does that mean? Yeah. Who determines that anyway? Do we vote on it or, or what? Mm -hmm. And uh, as you know, also, when we were young, the big moral expert in Catholic education in this country was Lawrence Kohlberg, mm -hmm. who was an atheist Jew who developed in Harvard this method of determining ethics. And he used to present this or try it out on this high school class near Harvard mm -hmm. with these unbelievable moral problems that no one could solve anyway. And he only believed that a few people had reached the ultimate in moral perfection, which was complete altruism. Mm -hmm. In other words, not because this fulfills my intellect or my will or whatever. And uh, the secret is, the strange secret that no one ever knew at the moment, is at the end of his life, he despaired of finding anybody who was like this. He thought maybe Jesus and Mohammed and Moses and a few others were. Well, he despaired of finding anybody who was like this. And so he drove in his car in the Atlantic Ocean and committed suicide. And yet he was, in the Catholic Education Society, the primary source for ethical teaching. And uh, along with him, uh, you, you had the values clarification. I also was assigned to teach in a high school. And I was also given a dumb book. I mean, it, was, it wasn't just dumb. Uh, it, 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 it was not Christian, uh, no. and, and I just couldn't teach it. And so, but this idea of va values clarification was uh, assumed that everybody has this natural goodness within this. And if you just let the students discuss among themselves, they will come to a good moral decision. Whereas in reality, when that was tested in schools, the schools that used values clarification techniques had students smoking earlier and more often than other students, drinking alcohol early and more often, engaging in sexual uh, experiences, and engaging in drugs early right. and more often. You know, these are, and they used those because you could measure behavior. By that, yes. And they wondered what happened. And what it was, in the values clarification, the kid who had tried any of this would get the other kids to try it too. Well, of course, it teenagers for, love that. Exactly. Yes. They went to the lowest common moral uh, denominator. Well, and in, this in, was, that was the, the fallacy. Well, in fact, Sidney Simon's book said right in the introduction, there's no right and wrong answers to this. Right. All we're trying to do is get the kids to discover what their values are, but there's to be no judgments made in them whatsoever. And, and, and uh, the, how can you have a Christ Christianity and have no judgments made on your conduct? And, or Judaism, or Islam, right. or even by the natural law right. to be a decent citizen. We see the result of people deciding their own morality on the streets of Chicago, New York, Baton Rouge, St. Oh, Louis, yeah. where people are being beaten, raped, and killed. And the folks who do it don't think it's, it's a problem. No, and they don't need the police either. Yeah. yeah. Now, this is, uh, in, in terms of the good that human beings have to seek, what is the basic good that makes a decision morally good? Well, in Christian terms, you'd say it's what can get, it's what can get you to heaven. Mm -hmm. But what gets you to heaven is to experience a deeper integrity in your soul. Now, of course, the reason we don't have integrity in our soul, Christianity says, is because of original sin. Mm -hmm. But that's another doctrine that was jettisoned in the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Because original sin is a sin of nature. And if you don't believe there's any nature, how could you have original sin? And if you don't have original sin, how, what do you have to be redeemed from? That's right. So, exactly. I mean, the whole thing was this house of cards 
that now has really begun to collapse so that in Catholic countries we have zero population growth. Well, well actually it's negative. Negative. Negative population yeah. growth, that their populations are going down. Right. And the birth rate is half of replacement. Yeah. Well, and I remember I watched, uh, to, sh to characterize the problem again, because St. Thomas C. adds a, a needed objectivity to all this based on an examination of the soul and its powers, the intellect, the will, and the passions. But uh, I watched an interview that was put up on YouTube from uh, Pathé News from the 1940s. They've mm -hmm. been publishing some things with Margaret Sanger. And she had just stated, you know, the founders of Planned Parenthood, the solution to the socioeconomic problems in Europe after World War II was nobody should have any babies for 10 years. So the interviewer says, well, isn't this a rather radical solution? And she says, no, it's the only way. And he says, what about the women who won't be able to bear children? Haven't you deprived them? Well, they'll just have to give it up. So then finally he says, um, uh, kind of exasperatedly, I thought this was funny, but childbearing in this country is the only thing at the moment that isn't taxed and regulated by the government. <laughs> and you want to do away with it? And so she looks right into the camera and she says, well, I guess everyone does have to make this decision for themselves, but as for me, no more babies. No more babies. In fact, when her own grandson was born, she was furious mm -hmm. with her son and daughter-in-law for having had him. And he, he later on worked for the New York Times and wrote about how his grandmother was angry at his dis existence. Yeah. You know, um, and in this modern world, the reduction of population is key. Whereas, you know, it's, it's one of the highest values that they promote with abortion, birth control, and also with the transsexuals. Yes. That they, this makes them sterilized uh, sexually and they can't reproduce. Right. All that gets promoted, the same thing with same-sex relations, you don't have babies, they promote this. Whereas, you know, God teaches that he cherishes the existence Increase of human and beings. And dominate the earth. And he wants human beings and cherishes them. That's not the case now. And this good is something that is being rejected uh, very, very ra uh, radically in our society. When I was a little boy, I believe the second question of the Baltimore Catechism was, why did God make me? Yes. And the answer was, God made me to show forth his goodness and to make me happy with him in heaven. Exactly. Now, how can, how can people be happy in heaven when there are no people? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> God created people because he wants to share his goodness with every living thing, and especially with us, and that's heaven. Mm -hmm. So also, when the more you experience human integration, like St. Thomas taught about, uh, the more freedom you have. That's what human freedom is. It's not exterior, freedom from exterior restraint. It's interior formation within, or what we might call integrity. But it's an integrity that's born of heaven because its purpose is to go to heaven, which we can't do by ourselves. So it's a proper preparation for grace. And then once grace is received, then we can actually... Um, realize our final freedom. That's why St. Augustine's famous thing is God whom to serve is perfect freedom. You know, we may think we're free, but it's like the freedom alcoholics think they enjoy when they're free to drink. They become dominated by the liquor instead of the other way around. When we, we have to take a break, but um, you know, one of the ways that we see this lived out in uh, or among those people who would think that freedom is you know, not having any restraints on my decisions. I can do whatever I wish. Among those people, when somebody gets in the way of what they want to do at the moment, you can see this tremendous anger 
and growth of hatred against anybody that would give restraints on their behavior. Whereas in the definition of freedom you just proposed, that when people find that they integrate their lives, they pull this together, including the bad things that they need to confess, as well as the good that they obey God in doing, that as they get that integrity, they're at peace. And I think we have to pay attention to the difference between the peace that comes from integrity versus the anger, hatred, and violent activity that comes when you define freedom as a lack of restraints. Right. This is a very important process to look at when you look at the news shows. We're talking about a, a fine book called A Primer on Fundamental Moral Theology by Father Brian Milady of the Order of Preachers, Dominican Fathers, and it is item number 83603 at EWTNRC.com. That's our religious catalog. And it, you know, it's, it's not going to be something that you might read necessarily while sitting on the beach. It's, it's going to take thought, but that's also part of the issue. Letting thought develop so that we deeply reflect on what's good, what's right, and what's moral. We're going to come back with some of your questions and further conversation with Father Milady, so please stay with us. Welcome back. Uh, before we get to some of our questions and more of uh, Father Milady's reflections, uh, I'd like to mention that we are going to have a, an EWTN family celebration. That will be on Saturday, August 26th at the Birmingham Jefferson Convention Complex right here in Birmingham, Alabama. And in fact, it's just about where uh, I-2059 and I-65 meet, right there at the corner. So it's easy to get to, and we'd love to have you come and join us. If you would go to EWTN.com slash family celebration, or call us 1-800- 447-3986, 1-800-447-3986 to register for this free event. It doesn't cost anything to get in, but we just want to know if you're going to be there. So we'd love to have you be there. And uh, a lot of us who work here, especially in Birmingham, will be there with you. All right. Are you ready for some questions? Yes. All right. Let's please. start off. Uh, Father, where are you from? Uh, I'm from uh, Nova Scotia, and I'm a priest of Toronto. Okay. Oh, wow. Good to have you here. Welcome okay. from it's the my pleasure. Dominion of Canada. <laughs> yes. And what, what uh, is your question? Uh, well, I mean, uh, as a priest, I've studied theology, and in fact, I was at the uh, the premier, <laughs> supposedly prepare, premier university in Rome, uh, the Gregorian, and uh, we had a huge course there that uh, purported to teach us and to <laughs> equip us with all of the, uh, the the skills that we need to answer these questions. Uh, and our course uh, was spent, uh, for the most part, denying that there are moral absolutes, if you can possibly believe that in the Premier Institute. It seems to me that there, we can have the answers, but if we continue to equip priests with... Uh, a faulty moral theology or a deficient moral theology, we're never ever going to accomplish the revolution 
or the counter-revolution perhaps, that we need in people's hearts to teach them the proper definitions of freedom, for example, to teach them moral absolutes. So uh, on, in two, I, I would say we have two problems. One is accountability, how we get the church to be a bit more accountable for a good moral theology. And the second is, how do we sell it? I mean, our opponents are such good marketers of, oh, you want to be free? Well, you can have this drug and you can engage in this wonderful, pleasurable activity. We're not that great at marketing. So one, accountability in the church, how we teach good moral theology, and two, how do we sell it? We are selling eternal life. How do we sell that a little bit better? Yeah. Well, that's what we're trying to do with the book of the radio show and all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I've been very much aware of this. I taught in Rome for six years. And the English faculty in the Angelicum was pretty orthodox. But the Italian faculty, oh my goodness. I mean, the, ch the head moral theologian was a secret dissenter from Humani Vitae. You know, people are going to go underground. There isn't much you can do about it. Right. And you can see how sad it was that the Lateran University, which had the John Paul II Institute, has completely uh, changed all the teachers in the last 10 years, most of whom dissent from what John Paul II taught in the Institute after his own name. So there isn't much you can do when everything's kind of in, in like a secret or something. Mm. Uh, I think what we need to do is what Cardinal Gagnon told me when I was asked to leave and come back. He said, look, Go home, find people who are loyal to the faith, and support them. And you, as a parish priest, can certainly do that in your parish. Uh, now, maybe some people won't accept it. Uh, and you, you have to find a way to not alienate people, exactly. But you do have a responsibility also to defend the truth. And you're the... I would say you're more important in some ways than some of all those big fancy professors over in Rome, half of whom don't really know what they're talking about. And uh, it, just because, you know, people say, well, you're going to Rome. Oh, you must be getting the truth. Well, I always say, look, who do you think started the whole thing? At Vatican II, all those people trained in Rome and all those universities. So uh, you can't look there. There's no place you can hide from this. But it's important to realize that everybody doesn't know this, even the people teaching it, in supposedly these high-class universities. And so when you find someone or you have find an opportunity in your parish to teach it, like you might have a class yourself in the catechism, let's say, and you can make that a part of it. Mm -hmm. um, little by little, it has to go. Uh, as you know, Benedict thought the church would be much smaller than it's been in the past. I'm not sure that's true, but it goes to show you that some people realize there was an issue. I, I think uh, something else, too, that uh, we may need to reprint some of the older books that taught morality. There are some very fine books that taught principles that were not, you know, uh, you know, filled with the ideas of Immanuel Kant and uh, the, some of these other folks dissenting. They taught, and it's not just that they give the answer, they taught how to think. That's, again, right. part of what I like about your book. You're laying out step by step. This is how you start to think through the issue and the principles so that you can approach a variety of modern problems with a solid structure of thought. And as far as, you know, some of the overturning of Pope St. John Paul's great insights, um, even in the school named for him, you know, after St. Thomas Aquinas died, there was a certain reaction against him too. Mm -hmm. But the ideas were too dumb to become part of church teaching. Eventually, the universities came back 
to St. Thomas because it's a clearer way to think and, in, and as you said, gives integrity, integration of truth and not going off on tangents right. of the moment that become very destructive. Right. We have, another, we have a caller. Mike, where are you calling from? Uh, good evening, Father Mitch. I'm calling from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania area. Wonderful, and, wonderful. And uh, either you or Father Malady can answer this question. Um, I was just listening to what you're talking about. And even going back to the old book, our priest and church leadership, they don't seem to go back to the church fathers, specifically St. Augustine, who was probably one of the biggest moral relativists prior to his conversion, and why he wrote the book, The City of God, and speaking about how you can build a moral, morally responsible culture. And it emphasizes, rather than have a city at the expense of God, we need one at the expense of self. And I think that he would be a good example, if not properly, to today's modern culture, because he certainly has seemed to embrace many of the values that we are today prior to conversion. And I'll leave it at that. Mike, very good insights. Thank you for that. Well, my lady? Well, yeah, except The City of God is a humongous book. <laughs> and it isn't systematic, exactly. No. So if you're trying to teach something in a more systematic way, you want a more systematic presentation. The fathers weren't too interested in systematic presentations. What they were interested in doing was answering the errors of the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of things they say are very beautiful. And I love St. Augustine. He has wonderful quotations. Um, in fact, uh, St. Thomas uses one of his quotations in when he talks about the vision of God being the primary end of human life. And uh, I always used to tell my students, if you can understand this, you understand a lot. And in Latin, it's even more beautiful, but it goes, uh, unhappy is the one who does not know you, even if he knows all the other things. Happy is the one who knows you, even if he does not know all the other things. Mm -hmm. And the one who knows you and all the other things isn't any happier for knowing all the other things than he would be for knowing you alone. And you'll notice the emphasis there of St. Augustine is on knowledge. Mm -hmm. Because the vision of God is actually something which occurs in your intelligence. But your will prepares for it. Your will is, it, I always like to say, the, the intellect's like the eyes and the will's like the feet. You can see where you should go, but you don't go there. Or you can just love, will, but not look where you're going and fall off a cliff. So they both have to go together. They, mm -hmm. they, this is where I was talking about playing off one against the other. Mm -hmm. You can't do that. But uh, now the fathers are, yes, they're excellent, but they're not systematic. And so if you're trying to present a more systematic view of the faith, um, things like St. Thomas are quite useful because that was his real, um, what would you say, his real um, strength was the ability to systematize questions uh, in a proper format mm -hmm. that people would ask in a kind of willy-nilly way without mm -hmm. any, any integration between them. So, um, but yeah, no, you're right. The fathers are excellent. But and, they're very and, hard to get into without some sort of introduction. Well, but the other point too, and, and maybe it's not just mm -hmm. the city of God that you're thinking so much about Mike, because he like he's talking about the importance of seeing the process of conversion from a more relativistic way of yeah. life, and seeing how he made you know, Augustine made the change, and perhaps uh, a better book, also a shorter one, to use what you said, would be his Confessions. Yes, the Confessions would give a sense of what he understood about his sin, what he understood about his conversion. Right. And that would still be very useful in our modern terms. And I think that Mike has a good point. Right. 
Let's go over to Sandy. Where are you calling from, Sandy? Hi, Bob Mitch. I'm calling from Missouri, just outside of Branson, Missouri. Good to have you with us. Thank you. And what's your question? Well, thank you both for being there. I just love your program. And I love you, Father Malay, every time you're on. And Father Mitch, I never miss you. And I just don't say when mothers are killing their children in their own womb, what makes us think they won't kill us? Yeah. You bring up, Sandy, an important principle. If they can convince mothers to kill their own children, then who would not be a, a target? Well, yeah, the, the, that the whole purpose is is cheapen human life greatly. Mm -hmm. um, we still have a concept of human life in this country, but I remember I was in Pakistan for about a month once, and the nuns sent me out to the for, uh, bazaar to buy some you know, rupees, you know, are worth nothing outside of Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And so um, I said, well, should I be worried? Well, she says, they'd like to see you wear your habit and then be fascinated by your rosy beads. But she said, Father, human life is worth nothing in this country. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's our general impression of it. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, as you know, we were talking about Islam today, and I don't want to change the subject, but man can't be made in the image and likeness of God because God is so other. So... What so, do you find? Oh, you mean he's totally different than all, anything, anything in creation and all of creation. Right. So, I mean, what do you base the right to life on? Mm -hmm. I mean, there really isn't one. Yeah. Uh, no, they, yeah they, they, their moral system is less based on rights as something you think about than God forbidding abortion. So in the right. Quran, it's God authority. forbids the, uh, abortion. And so Muslims are against it. But uh, in Christianity, it's not only the prohibition, but the essence of human dignity right. that we can think about. And well, understand. God could also change his mind tomorrow on that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. not, not for us. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, when you don't think there's a nature or right to life, and I'm, a lot of people don't believe in the spirit anymore. Mm -hmm. So we're just another piece of protoplasm or something that's mm -hmm. more and more uh, integrated than uh, some, some lesser form, that's yeah. all. Yeah. So, I But uh, I, I think Sandy's point uh, shows up in that in the very first year after Roe versus Wade was decided by the Supreme Court allowing abortion, it was within uh, one year that the murder rate for children five and under went up by a hundred percent. I would believe it, sure. And it, we, there's never been another group for whom the murder rate increased by a hundred percent in a year. Right. This is a, a re remarkable thing, but her point is exactly right. If you give permission to kill, then on what principle do you say it has to stop? Right. They well, don't. and many of the people I follow, especially some very good Catholic psychiatrists, say that the real source of this is contraception. Mm -hmm. Because once you separate childbearing from, from the marriage, mm -hmm. why have any children and what difference does it make? Mm -hmm. you know, one, per, one person is an object of use because that's what actually happens in contraception. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well, I want to have a child because it fits into my life, not because mm -hmm. God gave me a gift. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this in, is where, again, we see the absolute need to have principles for making these decisions. Now, we do have the Ten Commandments. Right. But the Ten Commandments also fit not only as a gift of God's revelation. That's one of the points you bring out. The difference between ethics and moral theology is that ethics only can use human reasoning. Reason. And that people start off with principles on, from reason. Whereas moral theology 
be, includes reason, revelation. but it begins with revelation. That's the basis. And I remember taking an ethics course during my philosophy studies, and there were in the 19th century a number of philosophers who kept trying to come up with an ethics without God. And the whole process with Mills and Stewart and all the others is that they kept refuting each other and coming up with no basis. And remember, no basis God, God is part of reason, too, not exactly. just revelation. Yeah. And so this is where, but they didn't want, no. they, they didn't want him to be in, and that was an act of their will. They didn't want God right. as a factor, so they're trying to use pure reason, whereas reason needs a basis upon which it can stand. God is the first basis, the foremost basis, and we also have what God has revealed, and this is where sacred scripture comes from. Oh, well, what reason should teach you is that there are certain questions reason can't answer. Mm -hmm. And therefore, there's a need for another science, which is revelation. Yes. Um, revelation is the most important thing, of course. But as you know, revelation based on bad reasons becomes Protestantism. Yeah. Because Luther's big problems were philosophical, not theological. Exactly. And exactly. Uh, so it's very strange how they have to all fit together. And I was astonished when I taught uh, ethics and had them read the Nicomachean Ethics of Aristotle, mm -hmm. because he actually says at the end, the purpose of the formation of virtue is the contemplation of divine truth. Yeah. Yeah. And this is, this is one of the things that we want, and it's what God also reveals that he wants, for us to be with him for all eternity, enjoying his beauty, his right. truth, and his love. Unfortunately, we Thank are you for having by me. time. Thank you for being with us. And if you would join me in blessing our audience, may Almighty God bless you and keep you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we can bring you Father Milady and all of our other guests and all the other programs, the special about uh, Blessed uh, Giorgio Frassati and everything else because this network is brought to you by you. Mother was inspired by our Lord to have it brought to you by you instead of commercials. So we ask you, as she did, keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill, and we'll be able to pay all of our bills too. Thank you, and God bless. <laughs>